Welcome to the Pharmacy Future Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Future Leaders is part of the Pharmacy Podcast Network, focusing on pharmacy student perspectives, interviews, and the future outlook of our pharmacy industry. Okay, this is Christine DiMacolangan, a P4 pharmacy student from the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, and you're listening to the Pharmacy Podcast. Welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. I am your co-host, Tony Guerra, for the Pharmacy Future Leaders Podcast, broadcasting from DMAX Ankeny Campus. Connect with me on Twitter at Tony underscore PharmD or on YouTube at Tony PharmD, where you can find over 800 pharmacy videos supporting my audiobook, Memorizing Pharmacology, and new book, How to Pronounce Drug Names, both on Amazon. Today, we're talking with Christine Demakilangan, a P4 at Philadelphia College of Pharmacy at University of the Sciences, who has specific interests in serving the underserved, community pharmacy and public health. Christine, welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Well, uh, I talked uh, with Sanish Shah uh, yesterday, and and these podcasts will be a little bit further apart, but I wanted to kind of get your take on this particular aspect of PCP, which, uh, while not exactly unique, it's certainly Uh, There aren't that many schools that are zero to six programs. So you're in a zero to six program. Uh, You've clearly had an early interest in healthcare and pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Uh, But tell me some of the early uh, influences that you had in deciding on that type of program. Because I think you mentioned some interesting choice between a rural school and an urban school, which isn't Mm -hmm. usually a dynamic we hear. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So initially, I actually wanted to be a nurse um, because I love the idea of helping people as much as I'm able to. And in my sophomore year of high school, I fell in love with chemistry. So I started looking up occupations with both helping people and my love for chemistry. And that's how pharmacy came up. And ironically enough, I didn't really want to go to PCP or Philadelphia College of Pharmacy when I started. I actually wanted to go to Albany College of Pharmacy because it was a rural area Um, But my parents actually convinced me to go to PCP, and that's how it all started, and I'm thankful for that. Yeah. I wish I could say I had that many choices, but I I was Maryland or bust, and and I really didn't have a plan B. I'm I'm lucky that I went, and and they now have a satellite campus, which would have been like three miles from my my home, but uh, I don't know. I don't know how that would have worked out, but it's always interesting how people decide, and and so uh, I'm just curious, though, because... uh, I think many people are scared of urban campuses. They have this kind of uh, fear of it just being so big and they're getting lost, especially if they've come from maybe a smaller private when they were in undergrad. So you're actually from Jersey, but you decided on Philly. Uh, Mm -hmm. So what made you choose your college once you kind of decided, okay, versus rural versus urban? Now, what is it about PCP that you really liked? Yeah. um, So I was born and raised in Jersey City, New Jersey, which is about 20 minutes from New York City. Um, So that's as big of a city as you can get. So choosing Philly over a rural area was pretty easy after I talked to my parents about it because everything is just so convenient. You're five minutes from maybe the movie theater or five minutes from the grocery store. So everything is within reach. Um, And even though you're in the city, the... PCP is a community. Um, The teachers there are very approachable, very personable. So um, they kind of make you realize, like, even though they're professors, you could still talk to them. that They're people, too, and they've been in your shoes, Uh, which is one of the great things that I loved about my school is because they didn't it just because they were professors didn't make it like you couldn't talk to them, if that makes sense. Yeah, and and I guess I I have to commend you on your academic or uh, maturity because you're going in at, what, 16, 17? When did you make your college visits? Because I was doing it when I was 21, (laughs) uh, so a completely different dynamic. What was it like being a high schooler approaching pharmacy school, approaching these interviews? Because I think of myself trying to interview at 17, 18, and that would have gone badly. So how how did you – how did you prepare for these interviews? Because you're a high schooler talking with doctoral level professors and things like that. Yeah, that's a interesting question. Because like in other parts of the world, they have a gap year. So they could kind of decide what they really want to do. Um, but when you're at 17, you don't really know exactly where you're going to end up when you're 24. So uh, I guess I didn't really know 100%, oh, this is what I want to do. Kind of just fell in love with it as I was learning more about it. 
Um, but I knew that a big part of me wanted to help people and I knew that pharmacy was going to get me there. So I guess that was the driving force with how I went about interviewing with other schools and looking at what school was the best fit for me. So it sounds like your, your why was, uh, the, the desire to help people within a mm-hmm. health profession, uh, yeah. got you through whatever challenge, uh, ended up in front of you. Um, I'm personally from the D.C. suburbs, the Washington, D.C. suburbs, and uh, living in Baltimore City was a shock to me at first, but I ended up loving that kind of convenience and vibrancy in a big city. Uh, Sanish was telling me that there was good skateboarding in Philly, so I was like, <laughs> okay, well, cool. That's actually a very cool thing uh, to yeah. think about. Um, what do you love about living in the city? You mentioned some other things. Yeah, uh, I'm a music person. I love watching concerts and shows. And Philly is a really good place to go to those intimate venues where you can actually meet the performers. Um, That's kind of how I got through pharmacy school is like, like not just the workload, but also having the fun stuff on the side, like getting to watch concerts and even going now it's Christmas season or the holiday season. So they have something called the Christmas Village where they have these little shops where they have, uh, little Christmas trinkets that you can go with your family and your friends and kind of have the feel of the holiday season. Um, So Philadelphia is kind of like a small scale New York City where you're not as small as you seem, whereas New York City kind of get lost in the big city. But Philly is a little smaller than that. Well, I I have to agree with you on on getting out of pharmacy a little bit because when I was was there, I actually worked at Pizzeria Uno's uh, just to get away from the pharmacy set. Eventually, I started working in a pharmacy, but that kind of idea that you're a technician and you're back to school and Mm -hmm. it just was a lot of – it was just a lot of pharmacy, and it's nice to have friends outside of it. It's nice to get away. And, and I was in Baltimore's Inner Harbor, just like it sounds like you're in a great part of Philly. Uh, yeah. Really, really just kind of fun, just taking advantage of what it is to, to be in the city. Um, mm-hmm. Well, let's, you know, Philly is the city of brotherly love, so there's a lot of diversity, a lot of, a lot of love there. But let's talk about the, you know, interprofessionalism that mm-hmm. is – Something that maybe wasn't really there when when I was in school, it was, okay, there's a med school party, it's a nursing school party, it's a pharmacy school party, uh, you know, afterwards. And when I say party, this is not, <laughs> it is just like a bunch of people getting together. Uh, yeah. But interprofessionalism is now something that's required by accreditation documents in the health professions. Uh, what are interprofessional experiences like um, that you have with uh, medical students? I know PCP facilitates those a little bit. Yeah, um, so I was fortunate enough in my P or U2 year going into my P1 year to apply for a program that my school offered called the uh, IP experience or the interprofessional education experience. And me, along with other P1 students, I think there was about 23 of us, we had the chance to go across the river into Camden, New Jersey, and help out with the Cooper Rowan Medical School and start the Cooper Rowan Clinic, uh, where we got to help patients who were who didn't really have a means to get uh, medications, like they didn't have insurance or anything like that. So it was a completely student-run clinic. We had our um, advisors, our pharmacy, pharmacy advisors, as well as the um, medical students and we got to work together with them, collaborate and help patients uh, who needed their medications. Every medication was sent out for free. Um, and that was something that was done on a weekly basis. Um, so that was a really cool experience in terms of that interprofessionalism that I think our profession is going towards. Uh, I think we're all used to working in silos. So uh, the doctors would work with just the doctors and the nurses would work with just the nurses. But I think it's a really cool turn in terms of kind of collaborating in order to get that exceptional patient care. You know, you have to look at all sides. So I think it's a great turn or direction that our profession is going into. And it kind of had us rooted from the beginning as P1s. And now being in our P4 year, we kind of have this mentality that we're all supposed to communicate and we're all supposed to work together. Yeah, and, and it sounds like uh, where, you know, usually we hear that things come from California and go east or something like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. In this case, it sounds like it's starting with the students, and then from the mm-hmm. students, it's going to end up being uh, something that maybe goes to the profession or that yeah. uh, your group that's coming out is like, well, we all work together, where mm-hmm. we're going to be the ones that are, that are kind of behind as someone who's, you know, graduated 19 years ago. Great, we'll be right back. But first, a word from our sponsor. 
At University of the Sciences, our students are ranked among the top 10 in the nation for salary after graduation. They are molded in the lab and forged in clinics. They are some of the most sought after graduates in the region, and they are proven everywhere they go. If you're dedicated to healthcare, science, pharmacy, or business, University of the Sciences is dedicated to results. See the proof at usciences.edu slash proven everywhere. Uh, so, Christine, you've been tagged as a leader by your faculty. I, I sent a, a note out to um, a faculty group, and uh, they picked you and Sanish as the uh, two people that they would certainly love to have as representatives of PCP with the innovative practices that you've been doing. Uh, so tell me a little bit about these innovative practices as it relates to maybe social media, uh, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, we don't see too many pharmacists or pharmacy students on social media. Uh, how have you been using it? Yeah, so um, I wouldn't say it's like innovative, but I think more educational. Um, uh, I spoke with you earlier and I told you that I've attended a couple annual meetings for APHA. And after every meeting, I would like post something about it and being excited about the profession. Um, so I think it's just the means of educating people. And I know, for example, I know you said like pharmacists usually don't use Twitter or Instagram, but I know one of my professors actually used it to kind of put the word out there. Um, it was an infectious disease elective, and he used it as a means to kind of, as a platform to kind of educate people on infectious disease topics or any um, stories that might be going on currently in the world. Like he would give us an assignment and say, post an article about this. So um, not only were we educating other pharmacists or pharmacy students, we were also educating other people who weren't pharmacists or pharmacy students about what our profession was capable of. So I think that was a cool means to have that platform of social media to kind of educate people because at the end of the day, um, it's our job, not only as students, but as professions to kind of educate other people about what we're capable of and what we are going to be capable, capable of in the future. Uh, such as like provider status or things of that nature. Yeah, and I, I have to agree with you, especially on Twitter. I think the assumption mm -hmm. is that you have to participate, and that's just not true. You can mm -hmm. just follow, and mm -hmm. I know some people that just follow certain streams, and that's their way of getting news in the morning instead of maybe an RSS feed or something like that. So you can follow uh, the associations uh, that you're most interested in. Um, and uh, so you, you've indicated in terms of you know your future, you have a passion and commitment to community pharmacy. And I think that being able to, on a certain level of autonomy, to have that autonomy is what really provides satisfaction for community pharmacists to say, okay, well, I want to take care of my population in mm -hmm. this way. Uh, what kind of services would you offer, you know, given the opportunity if you owned a, a store or you uh, had the opportunity to do it uh, in your community pharmacy? Um, I would just like to counsel more. Um, I think our profession is going in that direction, but I would personally like to talk to patients more about their medications and kind of empower them to take hold of their health, of their lifestyle. And uh, like I said before, it's all about education. So as long as they know what they're going home with, they'll be able to take hold of, you know, their lives and their lifestyle. Um, so that would just be my kind of take on what I would want to do as a community pharmacist if I were to have my own store. Well, I don't want to put you on the spot, but yeah. let's say I'm a busy parent and I'm like, oh, yeah. you know, I just got to get home. Don't worry. I know what it's about. How do you mm -hmm. maybe, I don't want to say change their mind, but right. how do you get, you know, just a maybe a minute or two minutes to just say, hey, you know, I understand you're in a rush. What techniques would you use uh, if you have a busy parent that's kind of pushing it off like, no, no, I got it. I got it. Uh, so yeah. that you can educate them. I would probably emphasize the importance of the medication, especially for young kids. Uh, we know that they kind of absorb medications differently. And if they're not told the exact directions, something could go wrong um, and kind of say, hey, I know you might be in a rush, but this is really important for your child, especially if you want them to get better. I just need an extra minute of your time just to make sure that you know exactly what you're going to do when you get home and just to make sure that your son or daughter really does get better after taking the medication and that, you know, I would love to see my patients come back, but I also tell them, you know, you being here is not exactly a good thing because that means that you're sick. So I just want to make sure 
as like it would be good to see you, but I don't want to see you in the sense that I don't want you to be sick again. I don't want your son or daughter to be sick again. No, that I would stop for you for two minutes if you were that nice and talked to me that way. So, <laughs> um, and and that kind of segues into what your seems what your main mission is, which is uh, to serve the underserved. Um, while uh, I grew up in a necessarily wealthy neighborhood, the poor part of the rich neighborhood. My family, my my father's an immigrant, and when he first came here, uh, obviously he didn't have any health care. He had nothing. Uh, we see it's become very political, you know, closing the borders, all of this. But we have big cities like Philly, like Baltimore, that are attracting all of these people that, you know, they're just trying to get a better life. Uh, their kids are just trying to get a better life. So we won't go to the political part of it. But I do want to know, it seems that pharmacy is really poised as a profession to help the underserved. Uh, how are you doing it or how do you hope to do that? How do you hope to serve the underserved? Yeah, um, I think our tagline is that we're the most trusted healthcare professionals. You know, we're the ones who are most accessible. As community pharmacists, we see the patients right after they get out of the doctor's office. Um, and I think even being as a student, especially in the IPE program, it's given me a whole new kind of lens in terms of looking at my patients. You know, it's not just them taking their medications. You know, you as a pharmacist would want them to take their medications, but if they don't have a means to get that, then they're not going to take it no matter how much you want them to take it. So I think the first step is kind of being in their shoes and kind of seeing, well, you know, if they can't afford it, if they're supposed to pay hundreds of dollars because their deductible is so high, how am I going to look for resources for them in order for them to take their medications? Um, and I think that's the first step. It's not just saying, hey, these medications are important for your health. These medications are going to prolong your life. Um, it's saying, well, how can I get you to take your medications in a way that you'll really understand how important it is to you? Yeah, and it sounds like you're getting quite a bit of experience um, in this interprofessional uh, situation mm -hmm. where maybe now you can call back to the physician's office, let mm -hmm. them know, hey, you know what, they came here uh, and the price of the medication or whatever it is, and, and we've, we, we won't even get into that debate because that's mm -hmm. just a brutal <laughs> debate with, with all of these, these, ri you know, these rises in the, the prescription mm -hmm. costs. Uh, but now maybe you have that sense of, okay, well, I have a good relationship with the physician. Maybe there are uh, some other ways, samples, things like that, uh, to get them through uh, whatever it takes. Um, mm -hmm. Your, your six-year experience at school is a little bit different where you're going to have, I know you've got the U1, U2 year, then P1, P2, P2. P3, P4. Uh, but tell me a little bit more about the longitudinal opportunities, uh, things that are happening over the course of your uh, college experience that are maybe a little different than someone who transferred into a school. Hmm. Um, I guess since you're starting off with your U1 and U2 year and you're kind of going straight into the professional years, you start off with the people and you finish off with those same people, which is great because college itself is a huge transition so even going from a senior in high school like cream of the crop you're at the top to being kind of at the bottom is a huge transition um so having people there to kind of support you and be your support system when you're going through this huge transition especially from u2 to p1 year because that's a huge transition in itself it's good it's good to have that constant amidst all of the change um, and I think having a zero to six program, while it can be a little intense at times, um, is super fun because especially at PCP, it's such a small community. So you really know everyone by the time you graduate. Um, just to have that constant is uh, really appreciated, especially from the faculty. Yeah, I know the when we talk about the pipeline and and getting students in there and keeping them in there and and chemistry is one of the things that knocks people out of the pipeline more than anything else and and mm -hmm. when you're kind of on your own uh, a lot of times it's a lot tougher but it sounds like you've got the community that made it a lot easier for you to get from u1 to u2 to p1 and then so on um so now that we're you know you're in your fourth year uh what advice would you have to maybe a p3 and saying okay they're they're choosing their appes now <laughs> Um, what what would you tell them? These are the ones that you're going to want to do if you want to serve the underserved, if you want to focus on uh, mm. that very altruistic uh, aspect of pharmacy. Cool. Uh, I would say be open to anything. 
Um, if you're really into serving the underserved and public health, definitely get more rotations where you can talk to more people, get to know their stories, like not just do one AMK rotation, but maybe do a couple AMK rotations or a couple community rotations. Um, I had the pleasure of doing a public health rotation with one of my professors um, called the Summer Medical Institute, where I got to work with other medical students and we got to go around uh, North Philadelphia and do blood pressure screenings, blood glucose screenings, uh, which I thought was a great kind of point of view to see where even at the bottom, there are people who still need our help. Um, and that's our role as pharmacists to kind of show them what resources they have, not necessarily like, like hold their hand, but give them the resources that they need in order to get the health care that they deserve. Okay, so tell me a little bit more about that Summer Institute. I've heard in New York where mm -hmm. there's pharmacies that are closed and they literally, all they do is deliver to you because everything's so dense, everything's yeah. so compressed, you can do that. But when yeah. we think of reaching out, a lot of times we think of the delivery, literally delivering the medication. Mm -hmm. But what you're talking about is different. You're talking about delivering care, identifying yeah. those who need care because uh, you know, you're getting blood glucoses, you're getting blood mm -hmm. pressures, you're finding out who's hypertensive, you're finding out who's diabetic. Mm -hmm. um, tell me more about the Summer Institute, how somebody uh, would uh, get into that or how some how you got into the Institute and then how long it is. Just more details about it. Yeah. So I heard about it from a friend, actually. And um, my preceptor at the time, Dr. Hassar, he talked a little bit about it. And I was interested because of the interprofessional aspect. Um, but I learned more about the actual project when I was going through the training and with medical students and other pharmacy students and even dentistry students and uh, occupational therapy students, we were able to build teams and go around the neighborhood in North Philadelphia and do these screenings. And if we found that they were hypertensive or they were on the verge of being a diabetic, we were not able to diagnose them. Um, but we were able to kind of be the liaison between them and a health center, a local health center, Esperanza Health Center. And they were able to take care of these patients because they took in patients who didn't have insurance, health insurance or anything like that. So we were able to be those liaisons to bring those patients to a resource that they might not have otherwise known about if we weren't there to tell them about it. Um, it is a program where you have to apply for. It's during the summer. It's about four weeks. Um, and there is a fee, but I, I know that there's a website about it. I think it's called the Medical Canvas Outreach. Um, but if okay, I mean, that's how can, I knew about it, we yeah. can put that in the show notes if you want to get that yeah. uh, to me. Um, mm -hmm. Well, let's let's just uh, end with a couple of uh, questions. But uh, before that, uh, what blanket advice would you maybe have for? Whichever you want to choose, either new graduates or maybe students thinking about pharmacy. What's uh, you've you've been there for six years. You're finishing up this very long journey, and you seem so satisfied and so happy with your experience there and with the future that you're going to have. Uh, what mm -hmm. advice do you have to others to make sure that they can get to you know a position where you are, where you're just very happy with what you've got and what you're looking forward to? Um, I think the saying is like make lemons out of lemonade. So I've always had that attitude of going out there and really just putting yourself out there and making the most of what you have. So ironically enough, like I didn't really want to go to this school at first, but knowing that I had to do that, I just made the most out of the experience. And just my advice would be to go out there no matter what kind of being comfortable with the uncomfortable. And just even if you have this kind of situation that at first you might not really like, just going out there and making the most out of it because you really do get out of it what you put into it. And I think that's why you see how satisfied I am is because uh, I've never kind of backed down from something that I wouldn't like. I just go for it no matter what the situation is at hand. That would be my advice. Okay. And then if somebody wanted to contact you, we can put it in the show notes, but what would be your uh, preferred way of being contacted? Um, I do use Twitter a lot and my Instagram. It's just C A Dimakulangan, so D I M A C U L A N G A N. It's kind of long, um, but that's where I would probably be reached at the most. <laughs> okay, okay. And then uh, just a couple of quick questions. What's your best daily ritual to keep your work on track? Um, I have a calendar on my phone. I have an iPhone, so if I have like meetings or appointments, I would just put it straight into that calendar just to make sure that I'm on track and that I know what I'm going to do for the day. 
So don't lose your phone ever. No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then what's the best career advice you've ever uh, received? It sounds like you've got some great faculty and mentors there. Um, it wouldn't be like faculty or career advice, but I think advice in general that I've received is just live life knowing what you want, but never expecting it. Kind of deal. Okay. And then what inspires you? Um, my family, my friends. Um, I am Catholic, so I have faith in that aspect. Um, and just right timing. Uh, I think time can sometimes be a hassle, but knowing that there's a right time for everything kind of inspires me to kind of go for it regardless of what I have in front of me. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for being on the Pharmacy Podcast. Well, thanks so much for having me. Okay. If you'd be interested in being on the Pharmacy Future Leaders, contact me at Tony underscore PharmD. And if you're interested in sponsoring an episode of the Pharmacy Future Leaders, contact Todd Yuri at PharmacyPodcast.com. We thank you so much for listening. Thanks for listening to the Pharmacy Future Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag Pharmacy Future Leaders.